Okay, first of all, uh, thank you all for joining, uh, family members, friends, and uh, uh, the examination committee. Uh, thanks again, Fabio and Sergio, for joining us today. Thanks one more time to my advisor, Mark Zendler, and my co-advisor, Max Kalinovsk. Uh, today, we're gonna be talking about my dissertation, which is assessing the benefits of MLOps for supervised online machine learning. Uh, we're gonna go through an agenda. The first step, we're gonna be doing introduction. We're gonna talk about the context and motivations of this thesis. And then we're gonna do a background on machine learning and MLOps. And then we're gonna present our two research methods. The first one, a practical project, a study of Rio de Janeiro's public bus line routes. And then the focus group, which is the developer participation, participation of the benefits of MLOps for machine learning applications. And then we're gonna wrap up everything on a conclusion, talking about the contributions and the future works for this dissertation. So the context started with uh, a literature review that uh, show us that the success, uh, the success of many productive machine learning applications in real world settings fall short of expectations. And that the academic community has focused intensively on machine learning model building and benchmarking, but too little on operation complex machine learning systems in real world scenario. And from a research perspective, this does not come as a surprise as the machine learning community has focused extensively on the building of machine learning models, but not on building uh, real life production ready machine learning products and also providing the necessary coordination of complex machine learning systems, components and infrastructure, including the roles required to automate and operate a machine learning system in a real world setting. So we can see that uh, still from today, that data science still manage machine learning workflows manually resulting in many issues during the operations of the respective machine learning solutions. Uh, and it can be observed that the use of software engineering best practice and machine learning operations is still relatively uh, unexplored uh, by the community. So after that, we understood that we have a, a, an objective to assess the benefits and limitations of the use of MLOps principles in the context of online supervised machine learning. And for that, we did a two-fold research method. The first one was to develop an, a practical supervised machine learning project. Uh, our idea was to deeply understand the problem and the MLOps principles usage possibilities on this project. And we also conducted uh, two focus group sessions among experienced machine learning developers so we could understand uh, the benefits and limitations of using the MLOps principles from experts' uh, uh, point of view. And we could understand how they use this on their day-to-day. -day. So starting with the background uh, on machine learning, uh, machine learning applications development workflow raises two main differences. The final output of machine learning application uh, of the development workflow is the model's outcome rather than the code for a normal software application. And also we see that the workflow requires a continuous feedback loop due to the frequent iteration involving model selection, hyperparameter tuning, and data set refinement. And I'm using uh, Califato, who is here today, <laughs> image adapted uh, that shows uh, the eight steps on a machine learning workflow uh, divided in group in three activities and their respective uh, their roles. So we see the first part is the preparation part where we have uh, the data collection, the data cleaning and the data labeling where we go through the data that we collected and we kind of uh, prepare it and we clean it with some uh, data that we're not gonna be using for our model. So the data engineer uh, collects this data, clean it and label it so we can go to the second part which is the analysis is where the data science start. Uh, the feature engineering is the part where we extract and select from the data set the most informative features from for building the machine learning model. And then we go to the model training where we keep doing this over and over again until we have a model uh, that is evaluated as uh, performing in a metric way, in a, uh, 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 in a in already decided metric way that the model is good enough. So the data science keep doing this on the analysis part. And then we go to the dissemination part, which is the part that uh, we're more focused on on this dissertation is the model deployment is the part where we already evaluated the model is good enough. So we put them into a production environment and this production environment uh, can help uh, business decisions, can help 
practical predictions to create these business decisions based on new data. And also after we put this model into a production environment, we have the model monitoring part it is where we keep uh, monitoring the model we, that we just went live to production to decide, to see if there's any errors, there are any decrease in performance. So uh, like model drift. So it's a really important part for us. And this part is made by ML engineers. And also the new uh, common name that's been showing up is the ML apps, which is gonna be talk, is what we're gonna be talking now. So the ML apps uh, consists on the best practice and tools to test, deploy, manage, and monitoring machine learning models in real world production. Uh, the ML ops focus on streamlining the process of deploying models to production and then maintaining, scaling, and monitoring. As we saw, is the last part is the part where we actually go to production. So there are seven principles on ML ops, and we're going to be doing a quick review of all of them. And the first one that we're going to be talking is the automation one. Uh, the automate uh, automation principle consists on automating the complete machine learning workflow, so it doesn't need any manual intervention during uh, all those steps. It can be divided into stages and areas, such as you can automate the test part, the deployment part, and the monitoring part. Uh, and this is good because we can break the automation into small steps and you can be building and implementing each one. You can start for tests, you can start for deployment. Uh, and some examples of automation uh, are source control, test and build service, deployment service, model registry, which is a part of restoring the model, uh, feature store, and also pipeline orchestrator. And we can see that the machine learning pipeline can automate the retraining and deployment of new models. And this will be uh, helping the reproducibility uh, principle. Uh, and as we're going to see through this dissertation, the automation principle usually uh, also have other principles inside it because it helps reproducibility. And also, uh, as we set up a CICD, a continuous integration and continuous delivery uh, system, it enables the automatic testing and deployment of new pipeline implementation which will help the deployment and testing principles that we're going to be seeing, seeing later. Uh, the second principle we're going to be talking is the monitoring. Uh, monitoring and a machine learning application is important for being able to understand problems with the data, model, and application after deployment is the second part of the, the, the path that we just saw on a workflow for machine learning. Uh, and some examples of monitoring uh, that the principle brings is to monitor data environment in training and serving inputs, also monitor computational uh, performance of a machine learning system, and also monitor the gradation of the predictive quality of the model on survey data as we put those models into live production. Uh, the other principle that we're going to be talking is the versioning. Uh, so MLOS versioning principle consists of organizing and versioning the data set and models by their sets. Uh, data versioning control describes the practice of storing, tracking, and managing the changes in the data set. And with that, it's possible to access all models version, perform rollbacks, perform the reproducibility, and retrain model from previous version. Different from common uh, code versioning that we see on software engineering applications, we have uh, a little bit different where the version, uh, it goes through, uh, focus on more on data set and models for the MLOps principles. The reproducibility principles is the process of repeatedly running a machine learning application on certain data sets and obtaining the same or similar results. It can ensure that the research can reproduce the accuracy of reported results and detect bias in the models. And this also has some government part where it's important for us to make sure that we can reproduce and prove to government uh, if needed uh, why the results were like that in the previous past. So the, the reproducibility also used the version as we saw before. So for us to go back and uh, be able to repeat something that was already uh, uh, merged on the past. It's important for us to have the versioning principle well implemented. Uh, the reproducibility also can help during the data collection, the uh, future engineering and model deployment phases. And the last two uh, principles we're going to be talking is the testing, which is uh, a little bit more complex uh, as the behavior of machine learning testing depends strongly on data and models that cannot be strongly specified. Uh, the principle then introduced the feature in data tests, test for reliable model deployment, and machine learning infrastructure tests as part of ensuring data and model quality, which goes a little beyond from normal software engineering tests. Uh, and the last principle is the deployment principles, which is the process of making models available in production environment, so applications and API can consume. And with this deployment, Practical, practical business decisions can be based on data generated by the model deployed.
So those are the MLOps principles. And you can see that uh, tests and deployments, as we saw before, they usually can be uh, seen on the automation principle also. So uh, our practical project was the first uh, method that we saw uh, opportunity to uh, understand a little better the use of MLOps principles. And our goal with this project was to predict the bus trip duration based on the trip departure time of the day and trip direction. Uh, and our idea with that then was to deepen the understanding of the problem and of the MLOps principles usage possibilities. So using information collected by intelligent sensors around the city to detect aspects and anomalies during a bus route, such as the total duration of a trip, the average speed during a trip, whether the bus uh, went out of its route to cut across, whether the bus during each trip wandered or did an unexpected route uh, with the data that we have. So uh, the data was uh, set public available by the Rio de Janeiro City Hall in the format of files in JSON format. Uh, and it contains a lot of entries, a lot of unique buses for 436 different lines traveling in Rio uh, area. And each line of the sample contain a uh, timestamp, ID, the line, the latitude, the longitude, and the speed of the bus at a given moment. And with this part, we had the data collection, uh, which is the first step that we saw on those uh, steps on the machine learning workflow. And with this information, we went to the exploratory analysis. So we did multiple analysis to understand the provided, uh, the provided data. And the first one was comparing the samples uh, and the company definition of the bus lines route. So we can see on the left side, it's the one that we had the plots that we did from the data sample. And on the right side is the Move It app that shows uh, the expected bus line routes around the Rio de Janeiro city. And we can see that they kind of match. If you go through the normal uh, uh, center size of the image, you can see that they match and they go through the same places. But on the data samples that we have, we have some anomalies, which is going to the north part of Rio de Janeiro on the top of the graph. You can see that sometimes the data samples shows that a bus was traveling around there. Uh, so we were trying to understand a little better. Uh, also, uh, just to, to have a note, the bus line chosen was the 450. Uh, the, the reason that we chose this line was arbitrary. So uh, with that view of uh, comparing the samples and the company definition of the bus line routes, we decided to add more dimensions so we could understand better what was uh, going on with the data samples. And the first thing that we did was sampling the coordination uh, with the samples by hour. And we could understand that from the graph that we show on the screen right now, that uh, around the expected course, uh, comparing to the sample that we have, uh, uh, usually around uh, normal hours of the day, so from 10 p.m. to uh, to 10 10 a.m. from 10 a.m. to 10 p.m. Usually the goes the the bus goes through the normal expected uh, bus line route, but around midnight to 5 a.m. usually it goes to the north side that we weren't so sure at the beginning what it was. Uh, we also did this sample uh, by speed, which is an interesting uh, fact that the region on the orange side more to the right side of the graph. You can see there is an orange part that says the speed of the bus around there is 80 kilometers per hour. And this is explained by uh, the fact that this region is called Aterro do Flamengo here in, in Rio, which is an expressway with no traffic lights. So it makes sense that around this place, uh, the data samples show us that the speed of the bus was way higher than expected and other uh, points of the car course of the bus riding route. So with those information, uh, we understand that the data set samples mostly fit the official bus route definitions, but it still lacks uh, context information. So we decided to add point of interest. Uh, and the first thing that we did was to uh, understand what, where was the end and the beginning of the shown routes. Uh, and with that, we created those green circles uh, as point of interest. So we could understand that that was the beginning or the end of a trip. And we also, uh, create those red circles on the north part that we understood that were two garages that the bus could be going after uh, the, the, the bus, line, bus line route was completed. So uh, those four are the point of interest that we have for our samples. And with this sample market, we defined it as a set of rules so we could split the samples into sequence that forms the trip. So we could have all the samples lines 
together. So we would form a trip and we would understand what was going on during all this trip. And from the handset data set, we analyze information from a new perspective, removing wandering trips and trips finished below 20 minutes. That was around 20% of the sample as we show in the graph. So we had 80% uh, uh, of, of the sample as valid uh, enhanced data set that we understood was good enough for going to the model training and evaluation. So with the Hansen data set generated, we had enough structure to uh, start a prediction. And it's possible to observe on, on this graph that the duration of the trip based on its hours of departure forms a pattern. And so we could be using a uh, reverse or non-reverse trips would be uh, going from point A to B or going from point to B to A, if that was a reverse. Uh, and we decided to use only non-reverse trips for uh, our prediction analysis. And we can see that the pattern, the pattern could be approached by a second grade polynomial function as we draw on, on the graph. So by that, we decided to use uh, the KNN regression for this experiment due to the scatter observed on the plot. So we use the Sigit Learn, which is available on GitHub. Uh, and we split the data between 70% training uh, and 30% to test. And we test all neighbors quantities between one and 30. And we measure the root mean square divided uh, for all training and test samples. And we observed that the RMSC coverage uh, between train and test around 10 neighbors. So uh, for our prediction, we set our N equal 10. And with that, we, we felt like we already have enough, enough information to start the predictions and we could collect uh, and we could achieve our goal uh, of understanding the data uh, from the data samples, how long a trip will be taking depending on the day of the time and the trip direction. So the important part of this practical project was the reflections on machine uh, learning operations within uh, this practical project that we were building. And the interesting part is that we didn't feel the need to use all the machine learning operations principles due to the complexity of the project and its scope. Uh, we didn't actually went to production environment. So uh, we didn't include the dissemination activities such as model deployments and monitoring. So we actually felt the need to use the versioning principle to be able to deal with the enhanced data as we were developing the project, but other ML principles we didn't feel the need to use in this early stage project. So uh, we believe that implementing an automated pipeline and the configuration of monitoring on top of the project, on this beginning of the project, could have brought us some benefits. And we listed some examples of them uh, as improve the project monitoring as a project will be configured from the beginning. So since the beginning, the project will already have monitoring and it would make it easy on the future to uh, add more monitoring and alarmistic. Uh, it would essay the deployment of new versions through an automated pipeline. Uh, it would facilitate automating versioning of for code models and data sets, uh, reducing the risk of inconsistency and being able to uh, create reproducibility, for example, and also enable using data streaming for incremental learning uh, if the data set is collected dynamically, which is possible uh, with, with the available data that we have. So with that, we wrap up the practical project. And after that, we move to the focus group, which is our second uh, research method. So the goal of the, uh, the focus group was to assess the MLOps principles from a practitioner's uh, point of view by promoting in-depth expert discussion through a focus group. And as a definition by Concho, the focus group session is planned for addressing in-depth discussions about a particular topic during a controlled time slot. So we decided to use two, to have two focus group sessions with six experts, machine learning uh, developers, uh, separated by three in each session. And despite their expertise uh, of all uh, of the participants, with machine learning uh, operation projects, uh, we still see that none of them decided to classify themselves uh, as more than a high level of, of knowledge on in MLOps. And after our literature uh, review, we understand that this might be because many companies seem to be still uh, maturing uh, their MLOps approach with data science still managing MLOps, M uh, machine learning workflows manually to a great extent. So we believe that's the reason why we have so many uh, participants setting their knowledge as medium. But we can see we also choose uh, three different industry uh, companies. We also have many company, uh, a big company size with almost every company 
with 40,000 plus employees and everyone uh, with high knowledge on machine learning. So the focus group planning and design, uh, we designed and performed our focus group by following the guidelines proposed by Concho, which is one of the first articles about a uh, focus group. And we use the goal question metric goal definition template to define the focus group goal. And with that, we came to the result, uh, this uh, phrase, the, the idea is to analyze the MLOps principles with the purpose of characterizing with respect to the benefits and limitations of the MLOps principles from the point of view of machine learning experts in the context of supervised online machine learning applications. So with that, we designed our focus group uh, and we separated it in three steps, uh, three phases that we're gonna be particularly talking about each one of these phases now. So the first phase was the preparation for the focus group session. Uh, we started by recruiting developers and characterizing these participants. Uh, they uh, fill a participation characterization form that would collect data uh, over them and their agreement to participate on this dynamic. The second phase was conducting the focus group session. So we had a, a, a Canvas Muro on an online platform called Miro. And we, for each statement that we have, we would introduce the statement. Uh, the participants would add the comments for each statement on, on the column they feel like they agree or disagree. And we're gonna see an image about it right now. And then we discuss the comments uh, that would in the end generate a meeting record for further evaluation. So that was the arc factor that we have from this phase. So uh, this is an minute image that shows how the canvas was built. On the left side, you can see the number one that shows the, the statement that we use. Uh, and on the top side in the middle of the screen, you can see the columns were divided by strongly agree, partially agree, partially disagree, strongly disagree, or no opinion over the statement. And after they decided which column they feel like about the statement, they would add post-its that would uh, have their, their opinion or the comments over the topic. And on the step three, we would be uh, discussing all the comments that we had on that specific statement uh, to bring more and more information about the topic. So the last phase of our, our focus group uh, was to analyze the data and report uh, uh, results. So we started analyzing the statement's comments. We took the Muro canvas and the meeting record for this phase. So we analyzed each statement comments, and we also used the discussion records to understand better what was discussed during this statement for each a group. And with that, we were able to report results. Uh, so we did this for each statement, and, and with that, we came to the results that we're gonna be showing to you soon. So the statements that we use, uh, they were divided in six topics. Uh, we're not gonna go through specifically in which one of them, because you can see that a little bit more on, on the, the thesis, but we separated them. The first one was about deployment frequency, which brings the deployment principle, the automation principle also. Uh, the second one was lead time for changes, which brings the automated principles also, the deployment principles, the testing uh, uh, principle also together because that's all part of good practice of MLOps to reduce the time for delivery and deployment. Uh, the third one was the mean time to restore, which comes with the idea about rollback, about reproducibility, and brings information about uh, the, the automation principle also together with it. And we have one sentence talking about monitoring, one sentence talking about versioning. And the last sentence was a general MLOps principle sentence where we would uh, say that uh, the phrase that I understand that this, the principle of MLOps helped me to deliver faster and more concisely, generating greater value for my application. And the idea on this last sentence was to brought up uh, a discussion all over all the statements that we had before and understand how the participants, the experts, uh, would understand the use of uh, the MLOps principles for uh, in overall for our, their day to day. So this was the resulted canvas for both uh, group one and group two. Uh, you can see that despite there were like a lot of uh, posts added to both of them, they're not so exactly the same. So we have uh, more people showing an opinion in one of them. Uh, we have topics that were more uh, strongly agree and the, on the other group was strongly disagree. So we can see there was uh, some changes between the groups, which brought up a lot of good discussions. 
So from that, we analyze the comments by watching the video and they automatically transcribe the audio. Uh, and beyond many sites collected, we wanted to highlight on this presentation a few of them. So uh, we understood that development team should consider the product scope and roadmap before implementing some uh, MLOps principles. And also this MLOps pra practice can help uh, corrections as a matter of urgency uh, for when a bug in production, for example, happen. Uh, also, we understand that the performing an application version change or a rollback is possible without implementing MLOps uh, as, for example, automated deployment pipeline and versioning for an early stage application. Uh, that was also something that we understood from the discussion. Uh, also, the monitoring usually takes a backseat during the prioritization of the project tests and having the MLOps principles implemented will facilitate developing alarms and monitoring. Uh, keeping the implementation at a good quality level without versioning is feasible in the early stage of the implementation, but after it can become uh, complicated. And also that the culture of following MLOps principles is still not so well spread over the academia and industry uh, groups uh, for machine learning companies. Uh, and we also understood that, it, that it's kind of a self-awareness uh, duty for all of us as engineers to uh, try to be aligned with these principles and try to be, bring more and more quality with you, the use of the MLOps principles on our day-to-day. -day. So finishing our focus group, we go to the conclusion. Uh, as contributions, this, uh, this dissertation assess the benefits of MLOps for supervised online machine learning application. Uh, the first practical project was a supervised regression machine learning application using TNN. Uh, with that, we identified the need to use the version principle only for an early stage application. We also presented the benefits that could be achieved if other principles were implemented during this practical project. Uh, our focus group assessed the MLOps principles from the practitioner's point of view, and we brought up uh, uh, some discussions and that really shows that machine learning developers believed that the benefits of using MLOps principles are many, but that they do not apply to all the projects they worked on. We also understood that avoiding error-prone manual steps, uh, the MLOps avoid error-prone manual steps by enabling it to restore the application to a previous state and having a robust continuous automated deployment pipeline. Uh, as contributions, we also understand that the balance, uh, we need to balance the trade-offs of investing time and effort in implementing the MLOps principles Considering the scope and needs of the project, that is really important. Uh, we also understand that the investments tends to pay off, uh, investments on implementing the machine learning operations tends to pay off for larger applications with continuous deployments that require a well-prepared automated process. And usually for initial versions applications, the effort might enlarge the scope of the project and in, in the and it might delay a first version to production. And as limitations in future works, we encourage considering different algorithms and high parameter tuning options uh, for our practical project. We also, during the development of the project, we came with these two questions. The first one, uh, is it possible to determine when the buzz render using only the sample patterns? Or using the speed information of the sample, is it possible to detect when the buzz arrived at the final station? We believe those two questions uh, will bring uh, uh, that need to other principles to be implemented. And with that, uh, we believe that uh, with that, we're going to be analyzing how other principles uh, besides the versioning principle would be used and the benefits in practice. And for the focus group, we believe that other types of empirical studies, such as the focus group, should be conducted to reproduce investigation more deeply and understand better uh, 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 how these MLOps principles benefits and limitations are in the day-to-day -day of machine learning uh, engineering, engineers. So uh, thank you very much for your attention. Uh, this was my presentation over my uh, dissertation, assessing the benefits of MLOps for supervised online machine learning. Thank you all again.